Hi, my name is Tim, and in this video, I want to show you how I set up the laptop to use uh, for Zoom for Bible studies. And I may also show you a few other things uh, with some different uh, music equipment and such. So uh, let's get started. We just finished our Sunday morning worship service with the guest worship team. Uh, it went great. The setup went very well. Uh, the setup I did beforehand is uh, what we needed in order to allow the worship team to come in and make the adjustments that they needed to make in order for them to lead us in music. And so now we've finished uh, packing up all the gear, getting it all out of the way, and I'm setting up for the weekly events, which means I need to set up the laptop for the Zoom for Wednesday night Bible study. And so I wanna show you how I do that and I've set up the video so you can watch me walk you through that process and then I'll take the camera and then show you a couple of the details about how that setup works. Okay, so let me show you all the different things I have connected and uh, how and why they connect. So starting with the computer, this one's the power cable. This one re receives the video from the camera. This one sends video to the TVs. And this one sends audio to the sound system. Now you may have saw me connect this little box down here. So what happens is the computer sends audio through this cable, which is connected to the headphone jack, into this box. This box, which does have a volume button right here, it sends the audio signal and converts it to a good format. Sends it out this microphone cable into the sound system. And let me show you where I've plugged that in here. On the snake, the laptop gets plugged in right there and you can see it's labeled and it generally works pretty good we've had a few issues every once in a while uh, I think in general those issues have been uh, perhaps a missing connection or a bad setting uh, but I think for the most part we've got those settings figured out then we've got the camera right here so you can see the power cable 
is right there on that side. It's a funny little U shape. There it goes. DCN. And then over here on this side is where the other end of that video cable comes. So video comes out this connector through this cable into this silver box right here. This silver box takes the video signal that the camera sends out, converts it to a format that then the computer can receive in, and then this white connector is to connect it to this specific kind of connection right here. Now you wanna make sure all these connections are nice and tight. They do have just a little bit of play, but they should uh, snap in just right. And then when you get on the computer and log in, you can open up your Zoom app right here. If it is logged in already, uh, that's fine. If it's logged into a different account, you can tell by the picture up here. That picture should be the Calvary Chapel logo. And if you're not logged in, you can just click the settings. And right here, you can come on down here to switch account or to sign out and sign back into the church account. But either way, you want to get on and test the settings right here. And you want to make sure the video settings show what the camera is showing. And they will, should do that if this box says FHD capture. You'll notice I have the HD option checked, which will give a nicer picture quality. We don't need to mirror the video because we're coming in through the camera. And that should be all on these uh, settings for the video. But then we want to check the audio. And maybe you heard me test the speaker first. And so the camera actually picks up audio. You can see it here on top, it has a microphone right there. It's not a great microphone, but it'll pick up the room okay. So you can test the speaker. You can also test the mic. Check one, two, check one, two. Check one, two, check one, two. And then if nothing's coming out, first double check your settings. This should say speakers, real tech audio for the speaker. The microphone should be the digital audio interface, FHD capture, which is that silver box. And then the second step would be to check your physical connections to make sure that first your computer cables are all plugged in properly, the headphone cable, the direct box, the connection over here to the snake. And then you would also want to go check that everything's on at the soundboard or the mixer. So let's go do that real quick. What we want right now is the laptop. You notice that it's labeled. And so you'll notice that my volume is turned up with this slider. You'll notice that the channel is not muted. Notice how the button is depressed. Press it in, the mute is on. Depress it, the mute is off. You'll also notice that my mains, these two sliders and this slider are turned up. You'll also notice that all the lights are lit up. If none of the lights are lit up, then you have to turn the power on. Let me show you where that is. It's on this back corner, back here. Let me see if I can get my camera back here. Oh yeah, you can see them right there, real nice. There's two switches right here. This closer one is a wider switch. It turns the power to the mixer on and off. This more slender switch back here, it sends power from the mixer out to microphones and instruments. This one, we don't ever adjust. There's a label down there, it says phantom power. And that phantom power is needed, it needs to be turned on to make the pulpit mic work. Of course, you have to have the mixer turned on for any of the sound to come out of the speakers for the whole system. All right, we're in the office. You can see we're in front of a bookshelf, which has some uh, different plastic tubs and they have labels. I also have this pile of cables with some different devices here. And so I wanna show you what they are and how I keep them organized. These tubs have labels. 
Uh, these top two in particular are used anytime you want to use different instruments. Mic XLR. So these are the cables that are typically used for microphones. They're also called XLR cables because of the kind of connection that they have. If you look at the tips right here, you can see there, uh, there is a male and a female. The male has the prongs and the female receives the prongs. And uh, this is called an XLR cable because of the type of connector. This is an XLR connection that they make. These are used for microphones. They are also used to take one end of a direct box. This is a direct box. There we go. You can see this one's labeled for keyboard. This is a, a radial stage bug um, SB2. It's a passive uh, direct box. And so what you do is you, for the output, you would connect an XLR cable here, and then you connect the other end of the XLR cable to whatever your, uh, your source is. So here we would connect it to the snake, to the channel we wanna use. It's like I showed you with the computer. The computer has a direct box designed to take uh, input from some kind of device, like a computer or a phone, and then send that into the sound system. Now, what is a direct box? A direct box is basically a converter box. It converts the signal that it receives and uh, then sends that signal in the right kind of signal type to send it to the, the mixer or the soundboard. So this one I have labeled for keyboard. Uh, you see it is labeled with input. Hopefully you can see that. There's a throughput. It's got a pad option and a ground lift option. Uh, don't need to go through all these options. Uh, just to say that I typically leave the ground lifted. So if there's a button, it would be pressed in, or perhaps it's a little slider. Um, if there's a pad, I typically leave that not engaged. So if it's a button pressed in is engaged, so I leave it uh, depressed or popped out, um, unless you need it. If whatever instrument you're playing is really, really loud, if the signal's too loud, you can use the pad. It'll automatically bring that volume down uh, 15, 20, 30 decibels, depending on whatever kind of pad is built in. The input receives a quarter inch, typically anyway, receives a quarter inch um, connection. This is a quarter inch. It's a guitar cable. It is a TS cable. You'll see this box is labeled quarter inch instrument TS TRS. Now there's different kinds of quarter inch connections. Maybe you'll notice here, this has one band on the tip. Okay, so that's a a tip sleeve connection, TS, because it only has the one band. Now we have another one right here. You'll notice that it has two bands. It's a tip ring sleeve connection or a TRS connection. Why are they different? Well, they carry different kinds of signals. A TS connection is an unbalanced connection. So it sends a signal typically from an unbalanced source. We'll say like a, like a guitar, a keyboard, whatever it is, that source is sending um, a direct line, an unbalanced signal out. Whereas a tip ring sleeve, it sends a balanced signal out. So it, you'll find these a lot of times on keyboards, rarely on guitar or bass guitar uh, pickups although uh, there are a few uh, that will do that. So typically you wanna do this. If you have a guitar, you want a TS cable, typically. If you have a keyboard, typically I would use a tip ring sleeve cable. Now, keyboards you can also use a TS cable. And some keyboards will even have uh, two outputs, a left and a right, and in which case, you could use perhaps two of these TS cables if you wanted to, but then you would neither need two of these boxes or you need a box like this one where the uh, through will actually change into an input if you send two signals into it, um, or you would need two different boxes, uh, two different boxes or one stereo box with two inputs. And then if you, your box can merge the signal like this one into one output, or maybe you have one box that will send a stereo output in two different signals, or maybe you use two different boxes. Uh, either way, um, I have found that it doesn't tend to make a lot of difference unless your, your keyboardist has a particular use case in mind, 
uh, or, or your guitarist or whichever may be the case if they want to send a stereo signal. Uh, but typically, uh, they will communicate with you about that. The basic way to do it, I would say TS for a guitar, TRS for a keyboard. Either way, send it to your direct box and then use the XLR cable to send it from the direct box to your sound system. Uh, you can obviously get a lot more complex with those ideas. But what I'm gonna do right now is go ahead and put my cables away so you can also see that it's important to keep things organized and by keeping them organized in, in the proper place, it's easy to retrieve them at a later time and uh, to set up um, in a quick manner if needed. I'm going to make sure to put my XLR cables in my mic XLR box. This is a very long cable. It's great for long cable runs. This should not be in here. A couple other longer cables. These ones with the colored sleeves are the nicest cables that we have. Um, Cables do not come, uh, or they come in a lot of different shapes and sizes and qualities. Not all cables are created equal. So uh, just because you can find a $5 cable doesn't necessarily mean you want a $5 cable. I would say generally expect to spend between uh, 10 to $20 on a decent cable, depending on the, uh, the length of the cable. 15 to 20 feet for XLRs is a good length in general. I would say uh, 15 to 20. You can get away with 10 depending on the situation, but anywhere from 10 to 15 to 20 for your guitar and keyboard cables. And then, um, you know, there's lots of great cable brands, cable companies out there. Um, but I find Proco from Sweetwater is a nice, um, just kind of a nice mid level, high quality. Um, relatively low cost cable that I like to use. If you need to go a little more budget end, uh, Planet Waves, Daddario, I think that's how you say it. Maybe it'll focus there. Focus. Maybe not. Anyway, uh, this Planet Waves cable is, is a little bit more budget friendly and it's a pretty good cable, very durable. You'll notice here I have another direct box, different size, different shape. This one's labeled for the guitar. Here it also has an input and a throughput. And then here I have switches instead of buttons for the lift and the pad. And again, I usually keep the ground lifted. All that does is disconnect the ground, uh, helps prevent ground hum loop which is one of the different kinds of um, interference you can have in your system. And then again, there's my pad right there, but I have it uh, turned off. I only try to use that if I need it. I like to keep these direct boxes with my guitar cables, where I'll keep all my XLR cables in their own box because microphones don't need direct boxes. However, I uh, just for the sake of ease, uh, consider it kind of a general rule that a guitar will need a direct box. Unless, of course, your guitarist has its own kind of special uh, setup for their instrument, which a lot of guitarists will, in which case they will also have what they need. But anyway, you can see I've got three different direct boxes in there. We should have a fourth one. Um, I'll just have to go look for it because uh, I know we used it. Put my cables in here. Uh, you can see on the shelf there's also power USB and video cables. All kinds of miscellaneous video and computer cables in here. This is miscellaneous audio. We have enough miscellaneous audio that we need uh, our own box for that. Let me show you where I keep the microphone stands and then I will show you how to set up a basic microphone stand. Stand by.
So this is the corner of the office by the bookshelves. You can see we've got some miscellaneous um, stands back there. We've got one music stand, we've got two speaker stands, and we've got two mic stands kind of hiding right there, two microphone stands. So if you need some extra microphone stands, look right there. Also, let me show you one more thing on the shelf. This is the box that I keep the spare microphones in when we're not using them. So this is a microphone stand. This is called a boom stand because it has this arm called a boom that can extend at an angle for uh, for whoever needs that extension, guitarist, drummer, etc. But uh, right now you can see that it's kind of uh, collapsed. And what I'm going to do is show you how to um, extend the legs, how to basically set it up for somebody. And then if you want to travel with it or take it somewhere else or just put it in storage, you can collapse it again so that it is a much smaller, um, much smaller kind of situation that makes it easier to store. So for the legs, if it has this kind of tripod leg system, there's usually some kind of a mechanism, a, a screw or a lever, and then you can extend the legs. I extend it all the way down and put the legs all the way out. It makes it nice and secure. Tighten this screw or lever nice and tightly. And you can set it down. Two pieces here, you have the, the screw or lever mechanism that will extend the second neck. And then you also have some kind of a, a pivot mechanism that will allow you to set it at an angle. So I'm going to pivot it first. Notice how I loosen it, pivot, and then tighten back. If it's tightened and you try to adjust it, what happens is there's rubber gaskets inside there. And if you do that too much, those rubber gaskets will wear down really quickly and your nice new uh, guitars, or excuse me, your nice new mic stand will wear out super quick and it won't be able to keep its angle. Uh, I can't tell you how many different mic stands I've encountered that were really good, except these rubber gasket, gaskets were no good anymore. And at that point, you can't really use the mic stand anymore. So I've got an angle set. Um, I'm going to raise it up a little bit, but you'll notice I also have a little screw mechanism or perhaps a lever here that will allow me to slide the boom out further. That's about good. I want a little space here to counterbalance the space here. I need to extend the arm. And now I'm going to set the angle a little bit steeper for myself. This is one of those things that uh, a lot of musicians will just prefer to set up themselves or perhaps it's already set up and they appreciate it, uh, but then they'll take and adjust it uh, because everybody's different. Everybody's height is different. Everybody needs a different angle on their stand. So I've got it set up for me. I like a st steeper angle there on the boom, but I need to adjust the height. So I'm going to take this screw mechanism here. Now, again, this is another thing where it's tightened. I need to loosen it. And then I need to adjust the height and then tighten it back. And then I just kind of uh, gauge. Without a microphone for now, I'll go get a microphone in a moment. A little too high. Put it back down a little bit. Now, it's, again, important to tighten, or excuse me, it's, again, important to loosen that screw before you make adjustments. This screw can become stripped. It can also damage this inside neck and over time that will wear and then your microphone stand will fail as well. Now, there are different uh, qualities of microphone stands, some with a lot nicer mechanisms and options. These um, on stand style boom stands with all the different traditional screw mechanisms are fine. Um, nothing wrong with them as long as you take care of them and are sure to loosen the, the fittings before you adjust them and then tighten them back. Um, but then, of course, there's higher end ones with different, some have a, a quick release lever, uh, some have a single turn screw dial that will adjust both the boom arm and the angle. Uh, they come in all shapes and sizes, but that's the basics of how to adjust a mic stand. Well, that concludes this video. Uh, you can see here in the background that I have the computer set up for Wednesday night, that I have the camera set up as well for Wednesday night. 
you'll notice I went ahead and set up the uh, guitar stand, the mic stand uh, for Sunday, but you'll also notice that they're out of the way. That way they don't get in the way of the other happenings this week. Um, oh, I also brought in the nice pastor's nice roller chair. You can see it there. So um, anyway, I hope that helps. And um, between yesterday's video of setting up for the guest worship team and this video of, uh, of setting up for Wednesday nights, uh, between the two, there's some real useful information and some helpful ideas so that you can set up for whatever kind of worship leader, worship team, or Bible study you have going on. And so with that, uh, have a blessed day.